In this video, we're talking about medical anthropology with Dr. Susan DeVitro, a researcher at Connecticut Children's Medical Center. In this conversation, we talk about what medical anthropology is as a type of applied anthropology, a bit about her educational background and what drew her to medical anthropology, her fieldwork experience, and also her research as a medical anthropologist. Dr. DeVitro's work focuses largely on domestic violence and intimate partner violence, and we'll be talking about how medical anthropology approaches these topics, as well as the current coronavirus pandemic. So let's get started. All right, hello. Today we are having a conversation with Dr. Susan DeVitro, who is a medical anthropologist. So medical anthropology is one field of applied anthropology, and we've talked in our classes about how within the American system we have these uh, like typical four subdivisions of anthropology. There's cultural, mm -hmm. uh, biological, linguistic, and then archaeology. But then we also have applied anthropology where we take, you know, what we learn in the academic, uh, academic field and actually use it to solve problems or to address questions in the real world. And so mm -hmm. medical anthropology is one way that anthropology gets applied. So Dr. Vietro, Vitro, sorry, Dr. Vitro, um, I'm wondering, can you tell us a little bit more about what medical anthropology is? Sure, yeah, so medical anthropology is really um, the study of health and wellness, illness, anything that kind of goes into the idea of health really broadly would be medical anthropology. Um, for me, medical anthropology is very much an applied discipline. It doesn't have to be, so I mean, there are people that are studying, you know, like shamans and um, other types of medical systems that wouldn't necessarily be applied, but for the medical anthropology that I do, it is definitely an applied science. And that is, for me, what really got me interested in the field. Um, I think anthropology is really fascinating no matter how you slice it, but in terms of being really relevant and something that I wanted to do, you know, for, with my life, it was the applied aspect of it. Like not just studying a thing, but trying to come up with solutions and trying to really solve some problems. Um, that's what was really drew me to medical anthropology. And, you know, to be honest, I didn't really even know that medical anthropology was a thing when I was an undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, and when I got to graduate school, there was a very strong medical anthropology department where I did grad school, which is at University of Connecticut. Um, and so that really uh, shaped the, what I, how I was exposed to it. And I got to really learn more about how you could really take the stuff that you learn sort of in the traditional route of anthropology and really apply it um, in a meaningful way. So in your work as a medical anthropologist, do you see um, like, are you working sort of across those traditional subdivisions of like cultural and biological anthropology or, or where does your work sort of align? Mine is more formally in cultural than, than, uh, than the biological, but I do work with some others. Um, I'm actually doing some projects, a project right now that has a biophysical aspect to it. So we're actually um, recording some EEGs on kids and um, getting some bio specimens from moms. So there is that biological aspect and I work in a hospital. So um, their, the work that they do is more within that biological domain, um, but my background is definitely within the more cultural, so trying to understand behaviors um, okay. more than anything else. But I'm starting to learn more about the biophysical stuff just because I'm involved in a couple projects that more directly address that aspect of it, but that's, that stuff's pretty new to me. Okay. If we can talk a little bit about sort of your education, starting out with, so it sounds like you studied anthropology as an undergrad? I did. So I, um, I went to Lehigh as an undergrad. Um, I was, didn't start out as an anthro major. I probably didn't even know what anthropology was, to be honest, when I was in high school. I don't think I had heard of it. Um, and I tried out many other majors. So I was an art major. I was an English major. I think I did women's studies for a hot second. So I really tried out all of the <laughs> as many disciplines. Um, I ended up graduating with a, with a major in Asian studies and anthropology. Okay. And then I did take some time off. I lived in New York, um, did non-academic things for a little while before um, going into grad school, which I think is a good idea. I mean, I um, worked really hard as an undergrad. I graduated a semester early. I mean, I took five or six classes a semester. So it was really nice to get that break mm -hmm. um, and just to experience other things. I think especially as an anthropologist, the more experiences that you can have that you can kind of bring in to the research that you end up doing really helps. Yeah. Um, and so that, so I took a, took some time off and then went to UConn. And um, when I started grad school, I really wanted to do more cognitive anthropology. That was kind of what drew me to UConn in the first place. They had a cognitive anthropologist that I really wanted to work with. And then once I got here and started to learn more about medical anthropology, that kind of changed my course. And so what was it about medical anthropology that ended up sort of calling you? Yeah. So, I mean, when I started grad school, what I really wanted to study was sex because I figured like what could be more fun to study than sex. And um, 
what could be the thing that I wouldn't get bored with talking and talking about and studying other than sex. Um, and so I actually did that. I started um, pretty early on in my graduate school career. I, um, I hooked up with another academic who was doing this research project on women's sexuality over the life course. And so I started doing interviews um, with women age 18 to 80, just about everything can you, uh, basically it was, what can you tell me about everything you know about sex? So tell me about your first time, the most recent time, what did you learn? How did you learn it? What do you like? What do you just like? Really everything that you can tell me about sex. Um, and what I found was that women across the board, and I mean, I did many, many interviews. This went on for a couple of years. They could not talk about sex without talking about violence. It just was not possible. It just had such a huge impact on whether it was their first sexual experience or, the, or uh, subsequent sexual experiences. It just, you couldn't, couldn't disentangle sex from violence. And that was really, um, that really struck me and it, it really changed my path again. And so I figured that I couldn't really understand much about women or really people if I didn't understand about violence. And so I started to really more directly study violence, domestic violence and intimate partner violence. And that's really within the domain of medical anthropology. And so that's what kind of drew me into that, um, kind of put me in that direction. So that's where I, really my whole career has been for the most part about intimate partner violence. Okay. So, yeah, yeah I've, I've read some of what, you know, I've been able to find published work that you've done on intimate partner violence, but you also seem to have a focus on the concepts of forgiveness and oh, yeah. revenge. And so I'm assuming those things fit together. Oh, yeah. um, did that come out of your research on on intimate partner violence? Yeah, so um, I actually had it was very fortunate to have some great colleagues when I was in graduate school who were like who are really in the um, in the field of the anthropology of religion. So I was also a religion minor and I took a couple of classes about it. And so I teamed up with some researchers who were looking at this concept of forgiveness. And I had done some research um, for my dissertation about sort of um, how we think about intimate partner violence and what, what are the things that we think of as our options as friends, neighbors, colleagues, um, family members of people who are involved in these relationships. And really this idea of revenge um, kind of came across, like people would, be, would get very angry and um, very animated about if they found out that someone had hurt you know, their sibling or their friend um, and would talk about how they would punish that other person. Um, so I started to really kind of dig into that um, with some other researchers, this idea of concepts of forgiveness and what role does forgiveness really have in intimate partner violence interventions. Um, so that's kind of what led me there. And so I have a couple of publications that really directly address that as an idea and sort of like other levels of cognitive processing. So understanding um, what is the role of forgiveness in trying to address some of these big issues. One of the things that was interesting um, as I was reading was just, you know, kind of um, problematizing, first of all, what forgiveness even means. Yeah. Um, and I imagine there must be a lot of variation within like different groups of people. Um, yes. Is that something like, does that also have to figure in with your work on intimate partner violence? Like do people's ideas of what's appropriate or acceptable or not vary according to other social factors? Absolutely. And that is a huge factor, especially for intimate partner violence. I mean, I think that if you look across, if you look cross culturally at what um, how this kind of manifests itself in these relationships. Play at certain places where it's considered really okay to be violent towards your partner, um, and there's nothing really in place, and there's no social sanctions for doing that. You see rampant abuse, and but in other places, it's seen as it's really condemned, and it's seen as you know really a big character flaw and something that's really. Um, that you would face some sanctions in your community if you do this to your partner, um, then you see places that those places have things set up. So there are social sanctions. Um, so the idea of forgiveness is kind of intermingled in there because to what extent is it even your role to forgive people who violate their partners? Um, and why would you? And under what, what circumstances is that forgiveness considered warranted? Um, there's tons of variation that I think is really interesting. Yeah, that is. And so thinking then, you know, if medical anthropology is an applied uh, science and applied anthropology, how then does your research, um, you know, how does that affect systems that are set in place or systems that are created in terms of preventing or reporting or, or dealing with concepts yeah. like intimate partner violence? Yeah, so I think that, I mean, some of the work that I do that's, that's very, has like this direct kind of goal 
um, is really about, so within the healthcare system, so I mean, I work at a hospital, so I'm a research scientist at, at Connecticut Children's Medical Center. So part of my work there really is to um, improve the response that we have to victims that are coming in with their children. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been, I've been really working with various departments to try to figure out how can we best actually talk to moms um, and others about their relationships. Like what is the best way to do that? Because what we know is that victims of intimate partner violence are more likely to bring their children in for care than to take themselves in for care. And so we see that as like kind of a, a critical moment that we could be um, engaging in some universal education and like talking to people and providing resources. Um, so that's one aspect of it that's pretty direct. Like how can we get in touch? How can we um, talk to everyone about intimate partner violence and really name this as something that's a healthcare phenomenon and let, it, let people know that they can come to the hospital and get connected to resources. So that's sort of one layer of it. And then I also do a lot of projects in the community. Um, so for instance, the hair salon study that I've done that um, has gotten a lot, that I think is a really exciting study. And this is, this, I did not de develop this, um, this work. It was uh, actually the Clairol Foundation many years ago developed a program called Cut It Out. And it was all about training hairstylists on how to talk to their clients about domestic violence. Mm -hmm. um, and again, thinking about like, where are the places where we could actually intervene? So if somebody's a victim of violence, like where are the places that they're still going or that they're allowed to go? Or where they have relationships where they would actually talk to somebody about what's happening. And so the hair salon is kind of a perfect place for all those things. Um, and so this, this program had been developed, but there was really no evidence behind it. So part of what I did was develop a research study to show actually women do come into the salon who are victims and they will disclose. And so we had a tablet based study to really track that. And we had um, disclosures at sort of other sort of well established national rates just to, again, we want to provide the evidence base so that then we can make it so that we have the justification to really roll something out in a big way. So we've been in, in touch now with um, salon schools. So as people get trained um, for how to do hair, they're also trained in how to talk to clients about intimate partner violence, how to make a referral, how to, what are the good things to say? What are the things that you should avoid saying? Those kinds of things. So again, trying to have a real direct impact. And when we first started doing the study, um, within the first week after the first salon that we went to, the salon owner called and had already referred someone to the local domestic violence agency and they were staying in the domestic violence agency. So less than a week later, she made a referral and that person managed to um, safely get out and get into a, a shelter. That's incredible. So, yeah. So it's really, it's taking this information and, and getting it into the hands of people like where they are and where they exactly. need it. That's exactly. Really, that's really awesome. And it's really about listening to, you know, I've worked with um, victims of violence for, for many years now. I mean, it's what my whole career has been. And it's about listening, you know, just being open to what are the things that you really need? What are the things that would be really helpful? Where are the places that you're going? Um, where are the places that feel safe? Um, listening and then de developing interventions that can honor those voices. Yeah. So for me, that's what's really powerful about medical anthropology is that um, really listening to the people who are going through these things and, and as fully as possible and trying to understand what their lives are like and how we can develop things that are that kind of honor that what they're going through. Yeah. So you mentioned, um, you know, conducting a lot of interviews with people and developing um, like ways of collecting information when people are in salons. I'm wondering yeah. if you can talk a little bit more about your fieldwork experiences. Um, in our classes, we've talked not only about what each of these, you know, subdivisions of anthropology are, but how anthropologists acquire their information during yeah. the research phase. So can you talk about that? Sure. I mean, my, the, what would be the most considered most like the traditional fieldwork experience was when I did my research in St. Lucia, which um, was part of my, during my graduate career. career. Um, and I was working, it's funny when I think that, so I was really inspired by, my advisor had done a study on, um, on sex workers in Barbados. So I was very interested in sex work and trying to understand how this sort of fits into the picture of domestic violence. Um, and you know, he when he went to do his research in Barbados, he was like a uh, white male in his 50s. He would walk down the street, and all these prostitutes would come kind of running up to him. And so um, I went to St. Lucia, and I kind of had in mind a similar project because I really wanted to understand um, what was sort of like some of the gender roles that were going into involved. And of course, when I walked down the street, prostitutes don't come running up to me. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I managed to, you know build a lot of relationships while I was there. And I really just went and kind of started hanging out and just started talking to people. Um, and that's, that's sort of the more traditional, I'd say, participant observation, although I wasn't really participating in the sex work. But what I found when I would talk to people in the neighborhood and ask them, you know, where are your prostitutes? Uh, they all thought that the, they had just recently gotten a couple of strip clubs on the island. And they said that that's where they are. They're all in the strip clubs, which was not actually true. But the idea that all strippers were prostitutes was really interesting. It kind of led me down this path of 
um, really studying the, the women who worked within the strip club. And then they did ultimately find some, some women who sold sex, um, but then, and was able to kind of use some snowball sampling. And from once I found one, I was able to find others. And so that was more of the, what I would call like kind of traditional anthropological field work, uh -huh. um, where I just kind of like show up and start talking to people and allow those conversations to evolve into something that then becomes more of a structured interview. Um, so that was sort of the, the, the most traditional for, mm -hmm. in terms of the, the research methods. And since then, I mean, since most of my research has been um, in the US, all of my research has been local research, um, I haven't really done a lot of the like traditional participant observation, but I'll give you an example. So when I first got hired to work on um, training healthcare providers on domestic violence, the first thing I did was I just talked to a bunch of healthcare providers. So like, let's have a casual conversation about this topic and let's do it as many times as I can to really see what are some of the barriers and what are some of the, um, what are some of the opportunities that we can be taking advantage of. So I think that starting from the level of, um, of a conversation of, you know, and trying to, you know, start off without making the assumption that you know what all the important categories are and that you know what all the important definitions are like starting before that so you can kind of let those important things emerge that i think is a big part of what i do mm -hmm. so when i start a project i usually will try to um start with the most unstructured of methods and then allow that to evolve into something that's more structured okay do you also like in your in your research you're working with teams of other anthropologists as well uh, usually it's me and there's one other anthropologist and then okay. the rest. So I work with a lot of clinical psychologists and I work for, with um, some epidemiologists. So we have a very multidisciplinary team. So where I work is pretty um, unique. I work at an injury prevention center. So um, I, I work with a, a, a wide range of people and then we also have some clinical. So we have some surgeons that are just interested in research that we kind of help to facilitate their research projects as well. Mm -hmm. But usually I'm one it's either me and then I have a colleague who's also a medical anthropologist, so we also work together on a lot of projects. Okay. Now, I'm, I, I don't know if this is the, the most structured question, but I'm, I'm curious with all of these, you know, disciplines of people coming together to look at, um, at, simil at the same problem, like what is it that, that is beneficial in having not just a clinical psychologist and not just, you know, practitioners, but what, is there that special angle of expertise that you bring in yeah. as a medical anthropologist? Yeah, I think that what, I mean, the role that I have taken on a lot of these projects is to really be able to um, work within sort of a qualitative approach. Um, I use both, like I usually start from the least structured and then it can evolve into something structured. But um, like for the epidemiologists that I work with and the clinical psychologists that I work with, they're very much focused on quantitative research, which I think is very important. But um, like my role is in a lot of these projects is to really like, learn from talking to people about what's happening rather than just counting things and so i think that that being able to kind of have that lens and being able to really be open to um thinking outside of those things that you can count is is you know part of what i do so i'll, I'll give you an example so i was recently um worked on a project that was looking at the nvdrs which was a national violent death reporting system um and so the epidemiologist I work with, who is amazing, um, she's an injury epi epidemiologist, she's used to like looking at these very large data sets and, you know, like crunching the numbers, which is very important. But my role with that was that um, we are also able to get all of the narratives. And so I was able to go through the narratives and do text analysis and like look for themes and identify other things that were happening. So she's looking at things, you know, she's doing sort of complicated, um, you know, statistical analyses and I'm doing something that's more about like how can we look at the narratives and understand what's happening um, from right. within those narratives. So there's really a role for both and so that's what I really like about the work that I do that it really brings both of those things together. That's great. So uh, with your work at Connecticut Children's, like your, your focus is, is still on the prevention of uh, domestic violence. Um, are there other projects that you're currently working on that are things that are on the horizon that are emerging for you? Yeah, so I have definitely in the last three or four years been more um, looking more at the intersection of intimate partner violence and child maltreatment, so child abuse and neglect. Um, and that is a result of getting hired by the Department of Children and Families a few years ago. So I've been contracted to work with them. So that has really opened up the field for me because prior to that, I didn't really take on child maltreatment as directly. So right now we're involved in a, this very large project with DCF where we're helping to um, evaluate a new service provision that's for families that have been impacted by intimate partner violence. So we were, so me and my team, we, we sort of helped to develop the intervention, we trained everyone, um, and now we've been involved in sort of tracking and um, trying to understand what some of the outcomes for that are. 
And we're also involved in like training, a lot of trainings for the workforce, especially now within DCF. We've been training on like, how do you um, talk about into a partner balance now that we're distance and what are some of those best practices that we can bring, bring in? And also, I mean, I was mentioning that BioFizz project. That's with um, a team of psychologists from UConn Health that I work with. Um, and that's, a, that's all about like adaptation and resilience in childhood. So understanding how um, children and children from age four to six were working with kids and their moms. So understanding how um, children who have been exposed to domestic violence, how um, that impacts their, them in, on sort of the biophysiological level. So looking at EEGs, looking at stress response, um, and all that kind of thing. So my role in that is really to um, recruit from within the shelters because I do a lot of work with the shelters. That's kind of my area. Um, and I also do these very long interviews with moms, some of whom have been exposed to a lot of trauma. Um, and then another researcher works with the child and then we bring them together and do other kinds of fun things. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. So I, I feel very fortunate because I'm usually working on a lot of projects um, all at once. I've also done some work since I started the Injury Prevention Center. One of their big areas is adolescent suicide. Um, so I've done some work on adolescent suicide with them, which is really interesting. Um, it hasn't been like a big focus of mine, but I've just assisted again, like when they need someone else to kind of like come in and take a look at what, what their methods are and um, do some focus groups or, you know, those kinds of things. They kind of call in the anthropologist. That's great. Yeah. I wonder if we can now kind of just uh, maybe segue a little bit, and this is more speculative than anything, but thinking about the, the current climate, we're recording this on May, what is this, May 2nd, um, yeah. which is, you know, the midst still of a uh, coronavirus pandemic, yeah. and especially with the information that's been coming out about increased rates of intimate partner violence, domestic violence, yeah. how do you imagine that medical anthropologists will sort of um, be, you know, dealing with this data or, or how will what's going on now, um, you know, be used by medical anthropologists to, you know, to maybe yeah. create programs or, or some sort of interventions in the future? Yeah, I mean, I'm actually involved in a couple of projects right now that are really specific to like, what do we do in a disaster? And what do we do? How do we address um, into a partner violence and child maltreatment? And it is really scary. I mean, all the rates that we're seeing now, um, the rates of intimate partner violence are way up. The child maltreatment, um, there have been some really um, serious fatalities that have been happening. The scary part about, about child abuse and neglect is that the vast majority of those calls that, that come into the care lines of people calling for help when they suspect child abuse or neglect are through teachers. And so now that no one is in class, there's no eyes on those kids. Um, and we know that people who abuse their partners also often abuse their children. So these things really do overlap. Um, and I think in terms of the role of medical anthropology, I mean, part of what med medical anthropology has really done or is, is always doing is sort of revealing some of these big structural inequalities. And I think that that's something that the pandemic is really doing as well, is showing how all of this like pre-existing like structural racism and institutionalized racism and um, like unequal access to resources is really highlighted in, a, in the time of the pandemic. And so I think that medical anthropology can, can help us to try to understand um, where are the, again, where are those opportunities for us to really intervene and where are the opportunities for us to really, at this point, try to um, invest in some real large scale changes so that we can address some of those major inequalities. Mm -hmm. um, for people that are trapped in a home right now with an, some an abusive spouse or partner or parent, it is a very, very scary time. So it's also about being creative. So how can we actually reach the people that are trapped in their home? So um, part of what I've been doing with my team is really collecting um, some of the approaches that have been done in other countries. So we know in France, they've been, they have like a code word for when you go to the pharmacy um, to indicate that you need some help. And some other countries, they're setting up, they're putting advocates at supermarkets so that when you're at a supermarket, you can actually get help and get connected to resources. Um, in Connecticut, they actually great change that they made um, like right early on in the, in the pandemic is that they made it so that you can actually file for a restraining order remotely. So you don't have to go to a courthouse. And so we have advocates that are working with um, with victims, you know, on the phone and actually able to help them file without having to go to a courthouse, which is a which is a huge step. So it makes it just to facilitate. And again, restraining orders aren't necessarily the answer for everyone, but at least it's something that can be done um, in some way to address um, what is a very, very scary situation. And part of it too is just like looking at a systems approach. So how can we be better prepared? So how can we make it so that 
domestic violence agencies and child welfare agencies are really involved in disaster planning. So get them at the table at the beginning instead of just saying, oh, right, well, wait, now we know that people who are isolated are more likely to get hurt um, and now trying to recover or try to address this problem that's been growing. So how can we be, um, you know, how can we like have an approach that's, um, that's more prepared when something like this happens. Mm -hmm. Confronting it at the beginning rather than waiting. Exactly, for exactly. So you see around the world, they've started to like really fund domestic violence agencies. I mean, in Connecticut, we're, we're always above, uh, and I'll say I'm also a trained advocate, so I also um, volunteer at one of the domestic violence agencies, but um, we're always at over 100% capacity, always. I mean, so I don't know what more demonstration we need for more investment in our domestic violence, our intimate partner violence facilities. Mm -hmm. um, but again, trying to like make it so that all those players are, are at the table, are, are part of the approach right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. how, does, um, how does medical anthropology interact with, um, with policymaking, like in, you know, not just in a situation like this, but yeah. do you find that there, that there are routes for the information that, that you are getting and the, the results that you're seeing? Is there a pathway to get that information into the hands of policymakers and to, to create those structural changes? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I am pretty new to the policy part of things. I mean, the where I work at the Injury Prevention Center, they actually, we have sort of four big things that we do. I'm part of the research arm, which is a big part. We also have policy work, which I'm just sort of new to, um, but then we do education and training. Um, and so, I mean, there is definitely a space for it, but that is, um, I think that being collaborative and working with stakeholders and being open to those relationships is a really important part of it. But the policymaking aspect is really new to me. Um, I was involved in a couple years, for, for a few years at the Injury Prevention Center, we were really trying to get the helmet law passed in Connecticut as a motorcycle rider. Um, you know, that I was like, you know, how, how can we do this? You know, this seems fairly obvious. Like when you pass a law that everyone has to wear a helmet, everyone wears a helmet. And guess what? The death rates go down, the, the traumatic brain injuries go down. I mean, it seems like a no brainer. Right. Um, it is not a no-brainer because there's so many vested interests and the, the opposition to the helmet law is so loud. There are a tiny minority of people that are so loud and they do show up to the Capitol on their motorcycles and scare people. And so it didn't win. I mean, we, it, got, it, didn't even, it didn't even come up. Like it didn't even, it didn't even rise to the level of a vote. Um, so I think that the policy aspect of it is really important. Um, I'm still learning how to, <laughs> how to do that part. But I, I mean, I have just in the past few years started to really um, build more connections with uh, policymakers, with the politicians. So I'm very fortunate that someone that I worked with at the Connecticut, who was working at the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence is now my representative. And so right. like having those people that, um, that will listen to the call is really important. And also just being open to wherever you can, wherever you can make an impact. So even within the hospital, I mean, this is a hospital that I work in. Um, it's not easy to make change in a hospital. It's mm -hmm. very hierarchical. It takes, it goes through a lot of hoops that you have to go through to make, even just to screen, like to screen caregivers for intimate partner violence. There's a lot that goes into actually making that happen. Yeah. So it's a lot, it's more of a long game. <laughs> There's a yeah. lot, there are not a lot of like quick solutions, even if they can seem very obvious and very simple. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You know, the helmet thing just makes me think like, I have to imagine the anthropology part really comes into, you know, understanding like what would be the opposition because it does seem like yeah. a no brainer put on a helmet then you don't have to you know you don't right. run these risks um yeah. but i imagine there's there's so much about like the identity of being a motorcycle oh, yeah. rider and the machismo and the, the you know the toughness of it that maybe yeah. people feels undercut by a helmet and so mm -hmm. is that where sort of anthropology comes in and says it's not just about the numbers it's about how people respond to these things yeah, it's really interesting. So what we did, I actually did a research project about just specifically about this, just because I wanted to know like what. So I, I worked with the um, the motorcycle instructors. So in Connecticut, you have to you have to go through a safety course if you want to get your license. So I started with the instructors and then was able to um, talk to and survey the the participants for an entire year of their classes um, and really delve into this, like what goes into your decision. Um, and people are very resistant to say that it is their peer group that influences them, but when you kind of listen to them talking about it and talk about, well, what happens when your friend wears it, like if your friend wears a helmet, are you more likely to wear a helmet? I mean, there's a lot of like this sort of masculinity wrapped up into this question too, particularly right. for the ones who are actually crashing and getting into the, and, and, and harming themselves the most nowadays are really that older group like of white males that they rode when they were younger and then they, 
you know, had a family and they, their families are grown up and now they're, they may be retired or they're, you know, and they go and they buy, you know, big bad Harley because this is the big bad motorcycle that they always wanted. Yeah, and now yeah. they can actually afford this very expensive bike uh -huh. and they really can't handle it and they crash and they hurt themselves. Um, but these are also the people I think that frequently, um, want to like sort of fit into this kind of idea of masculinity that does not wear a helmet right that you know that has a harley that, that like portrays this very particular look and there's not a helmet involved in that um right. so that's why i mean for when i when we're talking about what, what kind of interventions can work um and like what can we do that can really be impactful i think that there's some there are a lot of people that if we make the only way they will ever wear a helmet is if you make a law that they will never choose to wear that on their own accord so mm -hmm. you need the law to make it happen um likewise there are some people you know such as myself i'm always going to wear a helmet right so whether there's a law or not a law i'm going to wear one so for me i'm really fascinated by those people in the middle so who are the people that haven't quite made up their mind yet um and so and, and how can we try to sort of move the, move the needle and then in terms of getting the law passed I mean, the people who ride a motorcycle is a small piece of the, of the population. I mean, it's a tiny fraction of people in the population that actually ride motorcycles. So what's, what we really need to figure out is like the rest of the people, like the constituents and the people who are going to vote on this and the legislators. So they're listening to those really vocal people that are saying, this is my right, it's my freedom, how can you take my freedom away? Well, yeah. how can we have a ca counter narrative that's just as persuasive as that? Right? Mm -hmm. So what can that narrative be and how can we make it so that it's meaningful to the constituents and the legislators. Yeah. We haven't quite gotten there yet. <laughs> we haven't, I mean, I think that um, it has a, it's a very, um, it's a very political question. And even though from perspective as, of a medical anthropologist, it feels like a public health kind of question. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately it is very much a political question, that helmet law. Um, we've actually had some states that have overturned their universal helmet law again like and it's it's like a natural experiment because there's so much state variation like you get to see like okay here's the place that had a helmet law and then they get rid of the helmet law and we get to see fatalities and traumatic brain injuries go up places yeah. that didn't have it they then they instituted a law the fatalities and brain injuries go down so i mean it's not great but i mean it's like how else can how much more so it's it's right. also really eye-opening in terms of like trying to get into like the political realm of how things that seem like they should be really obvious and really straightforward if you're just looking at the numbers and you're just taking kind of a scientific approach mm -hmm. that that is all goes out the window when you get into the political realm like right. your numbers could be all correct it doesn't matter how much evidence you have it could be not persuasive at all to the politicians because politics is as much emotion as anything else absolutely right? probably more emotion than anything else i yeah. would say that's yeah. really fascinating yeah. well Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate this. Um, if I can get one last, maybe little sound bite from you, um, sure. the student community that we're, you know, that we're making this for at Hostos Community College, a lot of those students are interested in careers in the medical field. Um, but of course, I'm always trying to push anthropology. I'm like, here's <laughs> yeah. how anthropology can be good, and here's how it can yeah. be useful. Um, so, I, and I, I don't expect that the majority of our students are going to be going into anthropology. But I wonder, is there? Do you do you think there could be utility in um, you know pursuing things like anthropology and medical anthropology for people going into the medical field, into nursing, into uh, you know radiology, or people who want to be doctors? Is there? A, a good sort of outlet for that? Yeah, I think that um, in terms of like the role that medical anthropology can, you know, I actually work with a ton of um, students that are interested in the medical field. So that's a, like the interns that we get at the Injury Prevention Center there for the most part, they're mostly um, people who either want to become nurses or PAs or doctors or they're on their way to medical school or they're thinking about medical school. Um, and, you know, I feel like I think that medical anthropology should be taught in every medical school. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're actually working with the medical school at UConn to try to institute some medical anthropology courses that are there. Um, because when we get, because it's really about perspective, right? And so having this perspective where you can um, be open to other, you know, to other ideas, and particularly if you're going into a health field, I mean, our health is so personal. Um, and the way that we talk about our health is so personal. I think having that background of anthropology of really trying to get that insider's perspective and try to like really figure out where people are coming from and try to find solutions that are really meaningful to them. Um, medical anthropology can really, that can really be applied to so many different areas. So even if you end up ultimately becoming, you know, a physician or a nurse or any of the, anything else within the medical field, having that background of being able to like, like bring some, some, some true curiosity and some true compassion and some true understanding that you get from within the field of anthropology, which is what we do. Um, and trying to really come up with those solutions that are meaningful, that can only help you, right? That can't, 
that that perspective can only make you a, a more rounded physician or a more rounded nurse. Right. Um, so I think that to the extent that we can get the word about, about out about medical anthropology and get the word out about how useful it can really be, I think it does really have a role. And for those who are interested in, you know, in going beyond sort of an undergraduate, um, medical anthropology is one of the places where you can actually get a job, right? So I work at a hospital. That's I don't work, you know, know, so that's a nice part of it too, is that there are jobs out there for medical anthropologists. I won't say there's a ton of jobs for medical anthropologists, but there is a way to do anthropology outside of just academia within medical anthropology. So um, I, you know, I work with another medical anthropologist. We went through our training together and we, you know, so those, there are jobs out there for if you have that background. And I also think that just having some of it um, in your toolkit as you go on to pursue other things in the health professional and in, in the health profession is really helpful. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you so, so much. This has been- You're welcome. This was fun. Super Thank you. Huge thank you to Dr. Devitra for sharing her expertise and her experience. And if you're interested in learning more about medical anthropology or Dr. Devitra's work, I'm including some links in the video description below.